already talked about the problem of bin packing. Let me remind you what the problem was and what results we got. So the problem was that we have n different items and item i has a size of si. And we assume that all of our sizes are between zero and one. And we want to pack these items into packages or bins of size exactly one. And we want to use as few bins as possible. Okay, so the question was, what is the minimum number of bins? of size exactly one that I need to pack all of these items into. And we said that our item sizes are always greater than zero because if I have an item of size zero, it doesn't really contribute anything, right? And my item sizes have to be less than or equal to one because otherwise the item would just not fit into a bin. And then uh, we also talked about the fact that uh, this doesn't really affect the generality of the problem, the fact that all of our bins have size one, because we can scale everything. So if you just multiply the bin size and all of your object sizes by some constant C, it's still the same problem. Okay. And then we talked about the hardness of this problem. And we saw that it's not possible to find an approximation algorithm that runs in polynomial time and gives us an approximation ratio better than one and a half unless p equals np, right? Or in other words, we said it is np hard to approximate this with a ratio that is better than one and a half. Okay, and our proof for this was that we just had a very trivial reduction from set partitioning. And the idea was that it's actually NP hard to distinguish whether uh, two bins are enough or whether we need three bins or more. So the whole reason why I had this one and a half is because I can't distinguish between the cases of two bins and three bins. And then we saw two uh, very simple algorithms that gave us approximation ratios of two and then one and a half. So the first simple algorithm was to just uh, do first fit. You take each one of your items and you put it into the first bin that it fits. And if it doesn't fit in any of your current bins, you just create a new bin. And the second algorithm was, again, the exact same idea, except that we sorted all the items based on their size and we put the largest items first. And that gave us one and a half. Now, today I'm going to give you kind of better approximation ratios. And it would seem like uh, it's a bit, uh, let's say, contradictory with what we had last time, but it wouldn't be. So you will see that in the last result that we get, we will have a constant added to the optimal and that constant really makes it so that we don't have a contradiction. Okay, another thing that we saw last session and I'm going to review again, was that we can solve bin packing in basically XP time with respect to epsilon or with respect to one over epsilon, if we have two extra assumptions. So our assumptions were the following. My first assumption was that every size is at least epsilon. So for every i, si is greater than or equal to epsilon. And my second assumption was that the number of different sizes that I have, the number of distinct sizes that I have is bounded. It's some number k. So there are at most k distinct sizes. 
Okay. Or otherwise I can say that if I create a set where I put all of my sizes in this set, then the size of this set is at most K. Now, let's just go over that algorithm again. The idea is that I have K different types of objects. Right, because I have K distinct sizes and I don't have to really distinguish between different objects that have the same size. So I have K types of objects. Now, every object has a size of at least epsilon. So I can say that the number of objects that I can put into each bin is bounded. Or in other words, if I say that M is one over epsilon, actually you can take the ceiling. Uh, Oh, or actually you can even take the floor. Yeah. So every bin is going to have at most M items in it. So I'm just going to use this and I want to see how many different types of bins I can have. So every bin can have at most M items and these items have to come from one of K types. So let's say I have X1 items of type one, X2 items of type two, to XK items of type K. I need this sum to be less than or equal to M. So the number of different types of bins that I can have is bounded by the number of solutions of this uh, inequality where I have to, of course, give non-negative integers to X1 to XK. And then we said that we have seen in combinatorics that the number of solutions here is M plus K choose M or M plus K choose K. Doesn't really matter, they're the same. And we said, let's call this alpha. And then we applied the same reasoning again. Uh, I say that I wanna, uh, pack everything into a number of bins. And my number of bins overall is going to be at most N because in the worst case, I'm just going to put every item into a different bin. So how many different ways of packing do I have? And I don't want them to be necessarily optimal. It's just that I have alpha different types of bins. So uh, let's say I have Y1 bins of type one, Y2 bins of type two and so on and Y alpha bins of type alpha. So the number of bins, the total number of bins has to be at most N. So the total number of packings that I can possibly have is going to be bounded by the number of solutions to this inequality. And again, this is solved similar to there. So the number of cases is at most N plus alpha choose alpha. And this is less than or equal to n plus alpha to the power of alpha. Okay. So the algorithm was very simple. It wasn't even an approximation algorithm. It was just, you try every possible case. You just do brute force. And this is the runtime you get. Of course, times some polynomial for checking what is the uh, number of pins that you needed and and finding the optimal and so on. But anyway, all of those things are going to take polynomial time. But now if you look at alpha, alpha dependent on K, which is uh, assumed to be a parameter, it's assumed to be small, and also on epsilon. It didn't actually depend on M. So in a sense, this is an XP algorithm where our parameters are K and epsilon. Okay, nice. So we know that if we have this particular special case, we can solve it really fast. Okay, let me just write it maybe here. I can solve it in N plus alpha to the power of alpha times some polynomial in N and alpha was this thing, okay. So now I want to relax some of those assumptions. I want to see what happens if I only have the first assumption. What happens if I don't have the second assumption? So 
So let's say I have this one, but I don't have this one. The only thing I know is that all of my sizes are at least some number epsilon. And I want to find an approximation. Now, can I reduce this case to the previous case where I had both of the assumptions? Can I somehow make it so that I have assumption two? Well, not necessarily because of course, I might have a lot of different sizes here. It might be that all of my elements have different sizes. But I can maybe round the sizes up or down so that I reduce the total number of sizes that I have. Okay, but how would you do that? Well, we can do many different types of rounding. I can say that I want, let's say all of my sizes to be a multiple of epsilon. So I just round everything down or round everything up to the nearest multiple of epsilon. Should I round up or should I round down? I have to round up, right? Because if I round down, it might be that I have uh, a lot of elements that have very close to some multiple of epsilon in their size and they get rounded down. And then I get a solution that doesn't actually exist for the original problem. But if I round up, whatever solution I get is also a solution for the original problem. But the problem is what happens if I round up? It might be that my solution changes very dramatically, right? Because again, just imagine that all of my sizes are just some multiple of epsilon minus some really tiny amounts, much tinier than epsilon. And then it might be that, for example, I can put, let's say, 10 bags and 10 items in each uh, bag, in each pack, uh, or in each bin, actually. And then uh, after I do this, I can only put nine items in each bin, right? So this is not necessarily going to give me a good answer. But what kind of other rounding can we think about? Well, another way of rounding is that I can say I just pick some of the items and for every other item that I have not picked, I say that it has to have the same size as one of the items that I have picked. So I pick a bunch of items and for every other item, I just take its size and I round it up to the nearest size that was picked. Okay. This is another way of doing these things. And I want to have at most K distinct sizes. So maybe I can just randomly choose K distinct sizes in my size set. And then of course I have to choose the largest size and then just round everything up. And I can also do this in a more methodical way. I can say that I first sort all of my items based on their sizes. Okay, so let's say that this time I sort them such that S1 is less than or equal to S2, so on to Sn. And then I want to have K distinct sizes. So I just break my items down into K groups. Okay. So I take the first N over K items, S1 to S n over k, and then I take the second n over k items, and so on. And this is my last n over k items. So I have k distinct groups, and in each group, I just round up to the highest value. So I take, for example, s1, and I say I increase this to the largest element in this group. I take S2, I also increase it to the largest element. And I do the same thing here as well. Okay. So there are two questions here. The first question is how to choose a good K. So how many groups do I want? The second question is, how much does this affect my optimality? 
So does this really give me some constant approximation ratio or not? Okay. So what do we want? We want to get at least, let's say, a PTAS, right? So I want to have a runtime that uh, is polynomial whenever I fix the epsilon. Right, so for every fixed epsilon, I want my runtime to be polynomial with respect to n. My runtime right now is something like this. And you remember that alpha dependent on both epsilon and k. So I want this alpha to only depend on epsilon. So in other words, I want my k to be kind of a function of epsilon. So I'm just going to give you the answer, but the way this worked was again, that you first do the algorithm, you analyze it, and then you realize what kind of K works well. But for presentation, it's easier to just tell you what K is going to be. So I'm going to say that K is one over epsilon squared. Okay. And let me just define Q to be n over k, which is like the size of each one of my uh, sets. And this is basically going to be n epsilon squared. Okay, so now I don't have a problem with my runtime. I know that my runtime, if I fix epsilon, I've basically also fixed k, and then alpha was just a function of epsilon and k. So my runtime is just going to be n plus some function of epsilon to the power of some function of epsilon. And if epsilon is fixed, this is polynomial in n. Okay, that's nice. But now I have to deal with the second problem. Like how far can my result be from optimal? Okay. Now, after I do the rounding, remember that when I use the algorithm for both cases, I'm always getting the optimal answer in that case, right? So let me just give some names. So let's say that I is my initial instance. So let's say I is the set of sizes that were given to me in the input. And after I do this rounding, I get a new instance. And let me call that I up because I'm rounding up. Now, what do I want to find? I want to find the optimal answer for I. What can I find? I can find the optimal answer for I up. So I want to say that the optimal answer for I up is less than or equal to the optimal answer for I times some constant. And of course, as usual, I want this constant to hopefully be one plus epsilon. Okay. Now, to do this analysis, I'm just going to define another instance as well. And I'm going to show that with I down. And I down uses the same technique as here, except that we always round down. Okay, so in each group, when I want to round down, I just uh, reduce all of these sizes to the smallest size. So this is what happens when I'm rounding down. Everything. Okay. So first of all, what can I say about I down? What can I say about the optimal solution in IDA? Do you agree that the optimal of I down is less than or equal to optimal of I? Okay, so here's the thing. I'm taking my initial instance I and I'm reducing some of the sizes. Reducing the sizes cannot increase the number of bins that I need because whatever solution I have for I would also work for I down. It's just that the sizes are smaller. So yes, I know that 
the optimal answer for i down is less than or equal to the optimal answer for i. So in a sense, I still don't have an approximation algorithm here, but I can find both a lower bound and an upper bound, right? So I can run this exact algorithm on i up, and then I can run the same algorithm on i down, and it just gives me a range. And it says that my actual answer optimal of i is in this range. Okay, but now I want to prove this. So it's kind of hard to work with the optimal of i, let's just work with the optimal of i down. So let's try to prove instead that the optimal of i up is less than or equal to one plus epsilon times the optimal of i down. Okay, and of course, if I prove this, I have also proven this. So I've proven that my algorithm is a one plus epsilon approximation. Great, so now I'm comparing two things that I can actually compute. That's kind of better for me. But let's say that I compute the optimal of I down. Let's say that I find an optimal solution for the case where the sizes were rounded down. Can I somehow use that to find a solution for the case where the sizes are rounded up? And it doesn't have to necessarily be optimal. I'm just saying, suppose I give you a solution for this one, create a solution for this one. Okay. So here's the thing. You can just consider all of these cases uh, each one of our groups have the same size. I, I actually have to talk about the case where uh, the groups cannot have the same size, but let's for a second just assume that all of our groups have the same size. I will fix that later. Okay, all of my groups have the same size, and in I up, I'm rounding up. In I down, I'm rounding down. But I had also sorted all of my sizes. So what happens if I just look at a particular group? So let's say I just look at group two, okay? In group two, in I down, I'm just uh, reducing everything and rounding it down. But the weight that I'm getting or the size that I'm getting here is larger than all the sizes that I had in the previous group. And it doesn't matter if I round it up or down. It's anyway larger than that. Right, so if I have a solution for I down, I can just take whatever that solution does to group two and apply that to group one. And that gives me a solution for I up. And I can do the same thing. So I just look at my solution for I down, I see what it does to group I minus one, and I do the same thing to group I. And that gives me a solution for I up, except that I don't have anything for the last group. Right, so I can just take my solution for I down and it can cover every one of my groups except the last. Now, what do I do with the last one? Well, I say this last one, it has at most Q elements in it. Let's just put, put each one of those elements into a separate bin. That's the worst case that can happen, okay? So what did this just prove? it proved that the optimal of I up is at most the optimal of I down plus Q, right? Because I took a solution for I down, I can take any solution, I take the optimal one. And I just shifted everything by one group, that gave me a solution for I up, except for the last group. And the last group, I just said, I put everything in its own bin. So the, size, the, the number of pins that I use is increased by Q. And this is not necessarily an optimal solution for I up, but the optimal solution for I up would use less than this much. So the optimal of I up is at most the optimal of I down plus Q. Okay. So in the same sense, I can say that the optimal of I up 
is at most the optimal of i plus q. So instead of proving this one, I just go directly to i. OK, but this is still not what I want, right? So what I want is to show that it's 1 plus epsilon times this, but I just know that it's this plus q. So let's write these things more carefully. So what is Q? Q is N epsilon squared. What is optimal of I? So last time we had a bound on this, right? We had a trivial lower bound on how many elements we need. Right? So the idea was that suppose I can, uh, suppose that these items are liquids, I can just uh, separate them into different bins. If I could even do that, then the number of bins that I would need is going to be at least the sum of the sizes. So I need at least these many bins. So I know that the sum of sizes is uh, less than or equal to the optimal answer. And I from one to n. Okay, but what is my sum of sizes? Well, I know I'm I'm keeping my first assumption right. So I know that every size is at least epsilon. So the sum of sizes is at least n epsilon. So in other words, optimal of i is at least n epsilon. Okay. But here's the thing, I have optimal of i here, and I have n epsilon squared here, which is basically epsilon times this. So this whole thing is less than or equal to optimal of i times one plus epsilon. Okay, great. So now we have a one plus epsilon approximation but this is assuming that each one of our sizes is greater than or equal to epsilon. Now, does this contradict this? Not really, because here we didn't have any assumptions. And actually what this shows you is that the partitioning problem is really hard when you have a bunch of really small elements in there. So if you can assume that all of your elements have size greater than or equal to epsilon, you can even solve partitioning in polynomial time. And this is basically the algorithm for that. Okay. But now I want to even get rid of this assumption. Oh, one last point. So what happens if I cannot have groups of the same size? I just make the last group a little bit smaller. And still the same thing goes through, right? So instead of having exactly Q elements in the last group, I have less than Q elements. It doesn't matter, all of this works. Okay, so now I know that if I have this assumption and not the second one, so this one on its own gives me a one plus epsilon approximation. And the runtime is basically the same. Okay, so now let's say I don't want to have that assumption at all, and I want to just consider the most general case of beam packing. Again, I want to somehow create this assumption at some cost. I, I want to make my approximation a little bit worse, but I want to have this assumption. So how would I do that? I want to have all of my elements greater than or equal to epsilon. I can just ignore all the elements that are less than epsilon in size, right? But would that really give me an approximation? Not necessarily, because again, imagine that I have a ton of really small elements and I don't have, let's say any elements that are bigger than epsilon. Then if I just ignore all of my small elements, I'm, I'm using no bins at all, whereas I might need to use a lot of bins. Okay, 
So it's not really enough to just ignore the small elements. We have to do something a little bit smarter. So here's the thing. I can say, I wanna look back into the algorithm that I had for first fit that gave me a one and a half approximation, okay? There, what we were doing was we were sorting all the elements by their sizes and we were first adding the larger elements. So let's say we do the same thing here, but I change the definition of large and I say, I first add the elements that have a size of epsilon or greater. And then after that, I add all the other elements and to add those other elements, I can just use first fit. Okay, so this is my algorithm now. I say uh, first uh, pack all elements with size epsilon or more. Okay, and I know how to do this in a way that gives me one plus epsilon approximation. And then I say, uh, add all the other elements or all small elements, all elements that had the size of less than epsilon using the algorithm that we had in the previous session, so using first fit. Now, why do we think that this will intuitively work well? Because again, the idea is that we're first adding all the large elements, so we're getting all the bins that were inevitable, all the bins that we had there anyway, and then we're just adding these small elements and hopefully they're going to fit in the gaps in the remaining space in each one of the bins. But here's something about this algorithm that is not very natural. And it's that I'm just using this same epsilon here. There is no need to say that when I'm choosing which elements are large and which elements are small, I use the same epsilon. Right, because epsilon is what I want to have in my approximation factor. I want to have a one plus epsilon approximation, right? So here I can just use anything else instead of epsilon. So let's say I use something else, I, I call it epsilon prime. Okay, and I want this epsilon prime to of course be some function of my epsilon. But again, I will choose this function later. Okay, so elements that have a size of epsilon prime or more are called large elements. These are called small elements. Okay, again, as usual, we just analyze the algorithm first and based on the analysis, we figure out what to put for epsilon prime. But as usual, I'm just going to tell you what I'm going to put here. And I think it was, Epsilon divided by two or something. Yeah. Okay. So I take minimum of a half and epsilon divided by two. So basically I want my epsilon prime to be half of the epsilon, but if epsilon is already too large, I just take a half. Okay. Now, what do I wanna claim? I wanna claim that the number of bins that this algorithm uses, so this is what I claim, suppose this algorithm creates K bins. Then I have this, I know that K is at most one plus epsilon times the optimal number of bins plus one, okay. Now again, before I prove this, assuming that this is correct, it doesn't really contradict this one, right? Because the hardness there was when we wanted to distinguish between the case where we had two bins and the case where we needed more than two bins. And here, if optimal is two, I'm getting two plus one, which is three. 
So in any case, I'm not really getting a ratio that is better than one and a half. It's just that it's now one plus epsilon ratio plus some constant one. And actually this constant one makes all the difference. Okay. So let's consider what happens here. First, I'm taking all of my large items and I'm putting them uh, into bins and I'm doing that almost optimally. So I have a one plus epsilon prime approximation there, right? And then I'm taking all the other elements and I'm adding those other elements. Now, I said that I hope when I add my small elements, they all fit into the gaps and they don't introduce any new bins. Okay, so let's just do a case work. Let's say that I consider two cases. The first case is when these uh, small elements don't introduce a new bag, a new bin. I don't know why I say bag, a new bin. And the second case is when they actually introduce some new bins. Okay, so case one is small items do not create a new bin. Can you see that this case is trivial? Right? Because if you only consider the large items, we have this assumption for the large items and we had a one plus epsilon prime approximation there. And epsilon prime is less than epsilon. So it's a one plus epsilon approximation as well. So this case is trivial. Okay, now case two. Let's say that small items create some new bins. Now, I want you to remember the analysis that we did last session when we were showing that uh, the basic greedy algorithm for bin packing was a two approximation. And then when we showed that sorting makes it one and a half approximation. So the whole idea there was to just look at all of our bins and say that most of them are almost full, right? So in the two approximation case, we were saying that except for one bin, every other bin has to be uh, more than half full, right? So can I do something similar here? So let's say I have K bins. Okay, this is my bin number one, bin number two, so on, bin K minus one and bin K. And well, some of them were created by the algorithm that was packing the large elements, but some of them are created by the first fit when I was packing the small elements. So what does this mean? The fact that I created element in bin K means that there was an element that was one of the small ones and it didn't fit into any of the previous K minus one bins. That's why I added it to bin K, okay? So what can I say about these K minus one bins? How full are they? So my small elements have a size of less than epsilon prime. So I had an element that was small that has size less than epsilon prime and it didn't fit in any of the bins one to K. So all of these bins have to be full up to at least one minus epsilon prime, okay? But what does that tell me about the sizes? It tells me that if I just take the sum of all the sizes, where can I write this? Uh, let me see. Okay, let, let me just erase the trivial case and let's go back up here. So if I take the sum of the sizes of all of my elements, Okay, this is greater than the sum of sizes of elements that are in the first K minus one bins. So this is strictly greater than K minus one times one minus epsilon prime. Okay, 
And what else do I know? Again, I know that this was a lower bound on my optimal solution. So my optimal solution has to be greater than or equal to this. Okay, so if I just do some basic algebra, I have k minus one is less than the optimal divided by one minus epsilon prime. Okay, but you see another way of writing this is that it's less than optimal times one over one minus epsilon prime. But what I needed was one plus epsilon times optimal. What I'm getting is this thing times optimal. And that's the reason why I had uh, this particular thing here because I want this constant to be less than one plus epsilon, right? And if epsilon is less than a half, uh, okay, sorry, if epsilon prime is less than a half, then one over one minus epsilon prime is less than one plus two epsilon prime, which is epsilon. So uh, this thing is at most my optimal times one plus epsilon which means that the actual number of bags that I used uh, is going to be less than optimal times one plus epsilon plus one. And I can't avoid this plus one here because even though this side is an integer, this side is not an integer, right? So I need the plus one in any case. I can say that it's strictly less, but it doesn't really matter. Okay, yeah, so this proves the theorem. This proves that the number of bins that we used is at most one plus epsilon times the optimal plus one. So now the question is, does this mean bin packing has a good approximation? Does it mean it doesn't have a good approximation? It really depends on what kind of instances you're using for your real world use case. So if you're using instances where uh, it happens very often that you have only two bins, then you cannot have an approximation ratio better than one and a half. And so what you can get out of it is that you can get three bins every time at most, right? And that's not a great approximation ratio, but anyway, you're, you're using three bins instead of two. But if you have instances in the real world where you know that you need a lot of bins, then effectively kind of you have a one plus epsilon approximation. You have a one plus epsilon plus times opt plus one approximation. Yeah. So in that sense, the problem is both easy and hard. Okay, great. So now I want to talk about a different problem. Let's see. Yeah. Now, this second problem is actually very related to bin packing, and one of your homeworks is about finding this relationship. Okay, so this is called minimum make span scheduling. Or let's just call it MMS. Okay, what is the problem? The problem is uh, you have a bunch of different jobs so let's say you have n jobs. And let's say that job i takes ti time. OK, and let's say that you have a bunch of different processors or a bunch of different machines. So you can run these jobs in parallel. So let's say you have M machines. 
And just to make everything simpler, let's say that all of our machines are identical. So every job, no matter which machine you assign it to, is going to take TI time. And the problem is to assign the jobs to machines so that everything finishes as soon as possible. Okay, so the problem is this. Find an assignment. Let's call it F that takes the jobs one, two to M and maps them to machines one, two to M. Now, what is it that I want to minimize? It's what we call the make span. So for a machine, the make span of that machine is basically the sum of the times of all the jobs that are assigned to that machine. Okay, so make span of machine J is basically the sum of all Ti where F of I is J. Okay. And what I want to minimize is the maximum make span. So the entire make span is the maximum over all J of the make spans of J. And I want to minimize this. Okay. So forget about this formalism. It's basically that I'm assigning jobs to machines and all of the machines are going to start working at the same time. And I want everything to finish as soon as possible. And the make span is like the total time that it takes for me to finish all of the jobs. Okay, uh, first of all, you, sh you should be able to see that this is NP-hard. And as I said, there is a relationship to the previous problem. But let's talk about approximating. So you've probably seen this algorithm, it's called Graham's algorithm. Uh, you've probably seen it in operating systems courses. And it's actually an algorithm that a lot of operating systems use. So again, let's think about how we want to schedule these jobs. Let's just come up with a greedy algorithm. So let's say that I take my jobs from one to N and for each job, I just want to decide which machine to assign this job to, okay? So if I want to use a very simple greedy idea, suppose that I have assigned the first I minus one jobs and now it's the turn of job I to be assigned somewhere. Where would you assign it? I mean, it makes sense to assign it to the machine that has the smallest total amount of work, right? So the machine that has the smallest mix. That's Graham's algorithm. It just says, go over all of your jobs. So for I from one to N, you want to assign job I, but find the machine that has the smallest mix span. So Find the J with uh, the smallest make span until this point. And then just say that F of I is J. Just give this job to, to the machine that has the smallest amount of work to do. Okay. Now, again, usually as you've seen in this part of the course, our algorithms are very simple, but the thing that is hard is to prove that these algorithms actually give us uh, some constant approximation ratio. So I want to show that this algorithm gives me, let's say a two approximation, okay? To do that, of course, I first need to again, find the lower bound on my make span. So, Let's say that I have my optimal answer. How can I find the lower bound on it? 
So first of all, a very trivial lower bound is that if I just look at all of my jobs and I take the job that has the highest uh, time, then that job has to be assigned to some machine. So my make span is at least the maximum of all the times. Okay, so what I know for sure is that my optimal is going to be greater than or equal to the maximum over all i of ti. And actually, let's call this thing t max. Okay, that's obvious. Now, what else do I know? Well, I can just use the same idea that I had in bin packing. I can just look at the sum of all the times. And I can say, suppose that again, my jobs were somehow liquid, somehow I could divide them uh, in half or in smaller parts and assign each part to a different machine, right? So how many machines, would how, how much time would I need in that case if I could get like perfect balance? Well, I would still need one over M times the sum of all the times. Right, so no matter what I do, my optimal is going to be greater than or equal to this as well. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to define a lower bound L and I'm just going to define L as the maximum of these two things. So let's say that L is the maximum of my highest time and this average. So I know that my optimal is greater than or equal to L. Okay, nice. Now I have a lower bound. So if I can say that this algorithm uses at most, let's say, 2L time, then I can say that it's a two approximation. Okay. So let's analyze this algorithm. Suppose that I have assigned all of my jobs to different machines. And let's say that I just focus on the very last job that ends. Okay? And just assume that all of these machines are also doing the jobs in order from the first job that was assigned to them to the last job. So that it makes sense to talk about the last job that ends. So let's T last be the time that it takes for the last job. So the, the T of the last job. And again, just to reiterate, when I say the last job, I don't mean the end job. I just mean the last job based on the time that the job was ended. Okay. What can I say about this? But let's just look at all of our machines again. So I have machine one, machine two, so on. Let's call this one machine i, and machine n. And let's just assume that this t last was assigned to machine i. Okay, so let's say at some point I assigned it here. So just look at the situation right before I assigned t last. What was the situation there? So when I'm assigning a job to a machine, I'm always taking the machine that has the smallest load, right? So right before I assigned T last, all of the other machines had a load that was either the same as the load of I or even larger. So 
So plus uh, every thing that was assigned to machine J. So this part is this, and this part is T list. So T is the total time that I'm spending in my output. Okay, now I want to say that each of these two parts, so the time that I'm spending on T last, and the time that I'm spending on the rest, on these parts, I want to say that both of them, or each one of them, is at most end. So here's the thing. Let's first take t last. t last is the time it took for us to do this particular job. But this is definitely less than or equal to t max, the maximum of all the times for all the jobs. And that was, of course, less than or equal to n. OK, so great. I know that this part is at most. Now, how about this part? this sum with this sum here, right? Yeah, so this was, this was what? This is the average load per machine, right? But here, when I was putting T last into J, right? J had the smallest possible load. That's why I put it here. So this load of J was less than the average load, less than or equal to the average load. It was the smallest load. Right? And of course, after this part, I'm only increasing the loads. So in other words, this part, which is whatever was in J, load of J, is sum of all the elements that were put to machine J, Ti, is less than or equal to the average, which is the average load, which is 1 over M times the sum of all of my But again, by definition, this is also less than or equal to n. So my total time is at most 2 times n, which means that it is at most twice the octave. And this tells me that this was a true approximation. Okay. Now, how would you make the approximation ratio better? You see, our total time had two components, right? And we said that each one of these components is at most n. Now, which one of these components can I actually control and make smaller? This one, right? T nest. So, in other words, I can just use the same idea that I had for bin packing. I can just sort everything based on the times. And I want this T last to be as small as possible. So I, I sort from the larger time to the smaller time. So let's call this one, uh, I don't know, better graphs algorithm. And it's just graphs algorithm, but at the beginning, we sort the times. Such that T1 is greater than or equal to T2. Now, of course, I can do the same analysis and I can say it's a two approximation. But the question is, can I do a better analysis? Can I find a constant that is better than two? Here's the thing. If I can make sure that this last element is smaller than some constant times my optimal answer, so if I want, let's say, the 1 plus epsilon approximation, I need this last element to be less than epsilon times my optimal answer. So that I can say that, OK, this one is at most epsilon times the optimal answer. This is at most the optimal answer. So I get at most 1 plus epsilon times OK. So 
let's just let's use a square. And again, I'm just putting the epsilon value in here. But as usual, you would just do it symbolically and then at the end figure out what value of epsilon works for. Uh, okay, but before I do this analysis from the previous algorithm, I could on also see that my optimum is at most 2f. Right? Because a basic Rams algorithm gave me uh, 2l total time, so my optimum is be between L and 2. I will use this later. Okay. So I want to do a case work on what happens to my last job. So this is my first case. My first case is when t last is more than a third of the optimal. Okay, and again, this constant it came out of first doing the case work, doing everything, and then at the end seeing what's the best constant. And my case two is if t last is less than or equal to a third of the optimal. Which case is trivial? Okay, I can't see which one you're pointing to. <laughs> yeah, case two is trivial, right? Because we saw that our answer, whatever the, the graph's answer is going to be, it's going to be at most optimum plus t last. And if t, t last is at most one third of optimum, then in this case, I immediately have a four-thirds approximation. Okay, so this case is trivial. Let's focus on case one. So if I can say that in this case I also have a four-third approximation, then I can say that overall I have a four-third approximation. But I'm going to do something even weirder and I'm going to say that in this case my algorithm is exactly optimal. Okay? So the claim I have here is that my t is exactly equal to optimal. Okay, to prove this claim, let's just consider some different cases and then get rid of some corner cases maybe. So first of all, what happens if m is greater than or equal to m? So if the number of machines is more than the number of jobs, then I can give each one of my jobs its own machine, right? And then my optimum is just my t max, and this algorithm also gives me the optimum. So I don't have to consider the cases where I have more machines than jobs. Without loss of generality, I can then assume that my machines are less than machines, fewer than jobs. Okay. But if I have fewer machines than jobs, do you agree that there is an optimal solution that uses all of the machines? Because suppose that I have some optimal solution, and suppose that it doesn't use all the machines. Then there is a machine that has at least two jobs, and there is a machine that has no job. So just take one of the jobs of this machine and give it to that one. It would make your overall answer work. So again, I can also assume that every machine has at least one job. Okay, so I basically say without loss of general, assume that m is less than m and each machine has a job in our optimal solution. Of course you can also see the same thing using this algorithm. So 
This algorithm will also give each machine at least one job. Okay. So I'm going to use a proof by contradiction. And to do proof by contradiction, I'm just going to assume that my time, the time that the main span that comes out of this better graphs algorithm is more than If this is the case, then I can just look at the sequence of jobs that I had. Let's say I had T1, T2, all the way to Tn. And I can find the first index where my algorithm is no longer optimal. Okay? So my, in other words, if my algorithm is not optimal for the first n minus 1 elements, I just drop the last one. Because I, I just want to say that it's impossible for it to be non-optimal, so I take the smallest case where it's not optimal. Okay? So doing that, I, I'm not going to change my notation I that n. So suppose that I've dropped all the elements that were after this one. So suppose that when I added this drop tn, this was the first time that my algorithm became non -out. Okay. So, in other words, my solution, whatever my answer was, on the, let's say, elements 1 to i minus 1, that was the same as the optimal answer for elements 1 to i minus 1. But then suddenly, when I added the last element, I'm no longer out. Okay. So, Answer for elements 1 to i is not the optimal. And again, this answer is like the, the main span that I get with this up. case, it would always be literally Tn, right? Because my answer was optimal until, oh, sorry, this, this was supposed to be n minus 1. My answer was optimal uh, until n minus 1, and then I added this nth element, and suddenly my answer is no longer optimal. So this means that my answer changed. My answer increased when I added Tn. So it means that Tn is also the last element that is being executed. So in other words, this simple idea of taking the smallest counterexample means that I can now assume that uh, T last is Tn. Okay. T last. jobs can I have in each one of my machines? So, you see, I had sorted these things. So T1 was greater than or equal to T2, so on, to Tn. And now I know that Tn is T less, and so even my smallest job takes more than one-third of the optimal time. Right? So I cannot assign three jobs to the same machine. Because no matter how I assign that, it would no longer be optimal. So I can say that every machine has either one job or two jobs. Again, this applies 
points to both the case when I was going only on continuity and minus one, and to the case where I added the last, right? So, and if the optimal overall assigns one or two jobs, the optimal until here also assumes assigns one or two jobs. So, and my algorithm was optimal until this point. Okay. So I'm going to just focus on the jobs that had a machine on their own, like a machine that was only assigned to that job. Um, that the state of all the assignments after I've assigned n minus one elements was like f n minus one. Okay, so each machine has one or two jobs in f n minus one. Now, I say that the job is heavy if in f n minus one it has its own machine. some other job. So what was my algorithm doing? My algorithm had the optimal answer until Tn minus 1, and then it took the job Tn and try to just assign it to the machine that had the lowest load, right? But no matter what it did, it wouldn't get the optimal answer for the whole case, right? So even adding this Tn to a machine that already had one job would exceed the optimal solution. But Tn was the smallest time among all of these times. Right? So no matter how your optimal looks like, your optimal for all the n tasks or the n jobs, you cannot take a job that was heavy and put it together with some other job in your optimal task. Okay. So another way of saying that is that a job is heavy until point n minus 1 if and only if it's heavy until point n. Not if and only, sorry. If a job is heavy until point n minus 1, then it's heavy after point n minus 1. Okay. So a job is heavy if it has a dedicated machine in fn minus 1. And I just proved that uh, a heavy job has a dedicated machine. Optimal solution 
one to n. Okay. Now, do you see the contradiction here? Just look at these things that we have here. So the first one is saying that every machine can have one or two jobs. And that actually applied to either the case where you had only n minus one jobs or the case where you had n jobs. The second part is saying that if a job is heavy, if a job has its own dedicated machine after point n minus one, it will have to have its own dedicated machine after point n minus one. And again, remember our assumption. So do you see a contradiction? Let's just do some counting. Let's say that I have k heavy jobs. Jobs that were heavy here. So let's say k is the number of heavy jobs. So these k heavy jobs had their own machine and they're going to keep their own machine. Right? So how many remaining machines do I have for the other jobs? I have n minus k remaining machines. Okay, so this is the number of remaining machines. But how many remaining jobs do I have? So let's say a job is light if it's very heavy. How many light jobs do I have? So remember, each machine either had one job or two jobs. And the ones that had one job, those were heavy. So I'm just asking about the ones that had exactly two jobs. So I have two types. I have two times m minus a light jobs. Right? But this was in the first n minus 1 job. I also have this last job, Tn. So the number of remaining jobs is 2 times n minus k plus 1. OK, now do you see the problem? Our number of jobs is more than our number of and twice the number of machines. So there should be a machine that has three jobs. OK, so in the optimal answer, there is a machine with at least three jobs. But this was impossible because T last was Tm, and this was the smallest time that I had. And even this was more than a third of the optimum. So if I have three jobs in the same machine, the total time of those three jobs is going to be strictly more than the optimum. And that's a contradiction. So this contradiction came out of the fact that we assumed our algorithm is not optimal. So it means our algorithm is optimal. OK. So just to put everything uh, back together, I considered two cases. My first case was if t last is more than a third of the optimal. And in this case, I would show that my algorithm is basically optimal. So in this case, I have an optimal algorithm, or a one approximation algorithm. And the other case, case two, was that t last is less than or equal to a third of the optimal. But I knew that my total time t is going to be at most optimal plus t last. So this was the analysis that we had for the first version of the algorithm. So this is going to be at most four thirds of optimum. 
So in any case, I have an algorithm that gives me a four-thirds approximation. Great, so this is it for this session.